So it's Wednesday, and we're in Matthew chapter 26 today, just one chapter in our reading. Kind of a long chapter. Let me take a look. I think it's like 75 verses um, today. So, yep, 75 verses. So quite a long chapter, really pivotal chapter um, in uh, the Gospel of Matthew. Of course, Mark, Luke, and John all discuss extensively uh, Jesus' um, um, passion, his trials. Before we go there, though, um, let's get into that. Let me just um, thank you for all the uh, encouragement I've gotten recently. And um, I got a, um, emails from several of you. Several of you asked, have asked about supporting Theo Faith uh, financially, especially in light of uh, upcoming travel and things or potential for travel, see how this COVID-19 panic goes. But um, on my website at theofaith.org uh, is a donation page if you'd like to partner with me in this ministry. Um, I am uh, not yet um, have my 501c3 status approved. I just checked this morning with the IRS and it's still pending. So keep that in mind uh, if you might want to wait until that status is approved. Also wanted to let you know that um, this Sunday on the 11th of October, I'll be preaching, if you're in the area, I'll be preaching at uh, Estes Park Baptist Church, which is right off Mall Road. I'd love to see you there um, if uh, you're available. And I'll be preaching on the sovereignty of God in the United States, which I think is a um, very appropriate sermon uh, given our current um, status and the election cycle and all the things that we see going on around us. So the sovereignty of God in the United States this Sunday, Estes Park Baptist, if you're available. Love to see you and um, spend some time with you um, at church. So let's get into Matthew chapter 26. We've just made a transition. We just looked at the predictions of the king. Remember, uh, the focus in Matthew is on Jesus as king. So in uh, chapters 24 and 25, the Olivet Discourse, we looked at the prediction of the king. Now shifting to chapters 26 and 27, we move into a new section about the passion of the king. Let me, um, before we get into the um, outline of the chapter to help guide you through there, I'd ask you to turn to Acts chapter 2, uh, beginning in verse 22. I think it's important to keep in mind, especially as we see what's happening to Jesus um, in these chapters, that this is not an accident. This is not a, uh, God is not caught off guard. He's not trying to figure out plan B as he sees what's happening to his son. This is what God has intended for our good uh, to, and ultimately to bring glory to himself. That through Jesus's suffering, through these unjust trials that we're going to see, uh, through his death, uh, God is going to glorify himself. And certainly he has glorified himself in our lives as believers of what, in what Jesus has done for us at the cross. Acts 2.22 says, Men of Israel, listen to these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God with miracles and wonders and signs, which God performed through him in your midst, just as you yourself know. This man delivered over by the pre- determined plan and foreknowledge of God. Let me read that again. Turned over by the predetermined plan and foreknowledge of God. You nailed him to a cross by the hands of godless men and put him to death. This was God's plan. It says it was his predetermined plan. He made it before eternity. He wasn't caught off guard according to his foreknowledge. It's not as if God looked down the, anal, the hallways of history to see what was going to happen, as if he uh, didn't know. Uh, when we talk about God's foreknowledge, we talk really about his purpose, his, his plan. And that's what we see here, God's eternal plan being carried out 
uh, through Jesus, a plan for salvation, a plan to bring glory to himself. So keep that in mind as you read through this. Point out that uh, the chapter opens in verses 1 through 5 with a plot to kill Jesus. Now, this is a plot that has been ongoing for some time. Um, it's a plot that the uh, Pharisees and Sadducees were um, looking for an opportunity, an opportune time, and that's what we see here. They were plotting against him. The chief priest and the elders of the people gathered together in the court of the high priest Caiaphas. So as we've seen over and over in the Old Testament, we see it again in the New Testament that the leaders of Israel are leading Israel astray. It continues into the time of the church as we get into the book of Acts, uh, Acts chapter 20. Paul gives a dire warning that apostasy, that is false teaching to lead people astray, will come into the church through elders. That's why the selection of elders is so important in church. So we see in verses 1 through 5, this plot. This plot is happening on the same day that Jesus has condemned the Sadducees and Pharisees at the end of chapter 23. It's coming at the same day that Jesus told his disciples about his return in the Olivet Discourse in chapters 24 and 25. So this is a long, long eventful day. It's probably Tuesday or Wednesday by Jewish calendars. And then in chapter uh, verse 6, we see Jesus' preparation for his passion. We know from John chapter 12 that the woman who anoints him is named Mary that she is the um, sister, uh, if you dig through the Bible, and we'll develop this as we go through the other Gospels, she's actually the sister of Simon the leper. So Simon had been healed by Jesus. Uh, Jesus is in his house, and Mary is anointing him. Uh, this is probably happening, again, if we look to John's Gospel to try to get the sequence and time frame, this is probably happening on the following Tuesday. Uh, of Jesus's ministry. So, I mean, uh, Saturday. So Tuesday, we have the Olivet Discourse. We have the plot. Saturday, we have this preparation for Jesus. And then in verses 14 through 16, it seems like later that same day, we see Judas making a bargain. Then one of the 12 named Judas Iscariot went to the chief priests and said, what are you willing to give me to betray him to you. And they weighed out 30 pieces of silver for him, the price of a slave. Possibly in reaction to this anointing that's happened, you know, uh, this alabaster jar was broken open. Alabaster is actually uh, the term that they would use for marble. So this was a marble container that was broken open, poured over Jesus's head, a uh, very expensive uh, perfume that is being used to anoint him. And um, Judas is taking exception to this. And he's saying, hey, we're going in the wrong direction here. Notice how Judas is identified as well. One of the 12, this is Jesus's friend here. And we'll see the um, fruit of this betrayal later in this chapter in verse 47. In verses 17 through 35 then is an extensive discussion of the Passover um, that Jesus is celebrating with his disciples. Um, when we go to verses 26 through 28, this is kind of the core, the heart of what's happening here. While they were eating, Jesus took some bread, and after a blessing, he broke it and gave it to the disciples and said, Take, eat. This is my body. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he gave it to them, saying, Drink from it, all of you, for this is the blood of my covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. So this is, um, Jesus is saying here that what is about to happen, his body, his blood poured out, his body sacrificed, is the basis for the forgiveness of sins. And you know from your reading through the Old Testament 
that this is an allusion or a reference to Jeremiah 31, 31 and following, the new covenant, that Jesus is promising that his blood is going to be uh, the basis for the forgiveness that is coming to them through the new covenant. This is a ratification of that covenant. Covenants are ratified with blood. Jesus' blood ratifies this covenant. But in my view, some would not agree, but in my view, it does not inaugurate the new covenant. I don't think we as a church or church age believers are under the new covenant at this point. That if you go back and look at Jeremiah 31, 31, the new covenant is especially for Israel. We are experiencing similar blessings through Jesus that Israel will experience through the new covenant, but they're not the same. In fact, we can see this in verse 29. Jesus said, but I say to you, I will not drink out of the fruit of, uh, of the, this fruit of the vine from now on until the day when I drink it new with you in my father's kingdom. So the completion of this, this joy that's going to come through the fellowship between Jesus and redeemed sinners, that's going to come when the kingdom comes. That's when that new covenant with Israel is going to be not just ratified, but inaugurated. Think of it, for example, as our upcoming election. The president's going to be elected on November, I think, 3rd or 4th, but he's not inaugurated until January 20th. Same thing with the new covenant. It's been ratified by Jesus' blood. It won't be inaugurated until his coming kingdom. Verses 36 to 56, then, we see Jesus' horrific arrest. i just um, point out, as you read through there, just note how often Jesus says that this has been written, that this is uh, going to happen because it's written in the Old Testament. Again, evidence that God is at work, that this is not a, a surprise to him. This is what he expected. This is what he planned. This is what God intended to happen so that you and I, brothers and sisters, might share in the salvation that Jesus provides. Then we move into a new section that encompasses the end of chapters 26 here and chapter 27, Jesus' hearings. And we see Jesus in the end of chapter 26 before the high priest Caiaphas. And it's interesting here, uh, kind of... Um, a literary sort of um, construction that Matthew has used. I think I think the Gospel of Matthew is uh, just a literary masterpiece in so many ways. But it's not only Jesus that's on trial here before Caiaphas in this council. It's also Peter. Peter's also on trial. Peter. Jesus had told Peter that he's going to deny him three times, and we see Peter here. In fact denying Jesus. If Jesus is passing the trial, Peter is failing. So we see this um, one of six trials that Jesus underwent. Um, there's three trials as we go through all the Gospels. There'll be three trials before uh, religious authorities. Let me just lay, lay those out for you. There's a trial in John chapter 18, verses 12 through 14. Another trial here, Matthew 26, 57 to 68. And a third trial, very short, Matthew 27, verses 1 and 2. So there's these three religious trials. And the outcome of these is Jesus is convicted of blasphemy. And under Jewish law, blasphemy was deserving of death. Now, they couldn't put Jesus to death. They had to take him to Pilate to get permission to put him to death. Then we see three civil trials that Jesus is tried before uh, civil authorities. So the Jewish authorities found him guilty of blasphemy. The civil authorities, the Roman authorities, found him uh, guilty uh, and I maybe use air quotes, guilty. They were convinced that he was guilty of sedition. 
that is, of leading a rebellion against Rome. So both uh, the Jews and the Romans combined to bring charges against Jesus of capital significance, capital offenses. Look what happens also in this trial in verse, uh, I made a note here, 63. It's easy to skip over some of these things, and I'm going a little long, I'm sorry here. But Jesus kept silent. So he's being questioned and he is keeping silence. And then the high priest said to him, I adjure you by the living God that you tell us whether you are the Christ, the Son of God. Only then does Jesus confess who he is. Why? Because he's put under oath. When the high priest says, I adjure you, he puts him under oath. Jesus' trial before the religious authorities was a, a sham There's um, a book later, the Mishnah, that records traditions of the Pharisees that may have been in place at this time. The Mishnah was made about 200 AD, so it's a little later, but it may give us some insight into how a trial was supposed to be uh, conducted. For one thing, the trial was prohibited, a capital trial, was prohibited from being tried at night. And Jesus is being tried at night before Caiaphas. Also, it was prohibited from rendering a verdict on the same day as a trial in capital offenses. Now, if the person that was being tried is found innocent, that innocent verdict can be rendered immediately. But a verdict of guilty cannot be rendered immediately. There has to be at least a day of deliberation. And also that it couldn't be uh, sentenced to death on the eve of a Sabbath or the eve of a Passover. Again, another violation here. In the Mishnah, that's in Mishnah chapter 4. In Mishnah chapter 11, it says that a capital trial must be conducted in the temple complex. Matthew and the other gospel writers go out of their way to tell us that this was in the home of the high priest. So Jesus was tried by ungodly men, by false shepherds. The true shepherd is tried. And by uh, illegal means, he is sentenced to death under Jewish law. And he's going to be taken to Pilate, where there's going to be uh, convincing him that Jesus is a political threat as well. So brothers and sisters, as we uh, look at this chapter, a couple of applications, I think, is that uh, God has intended from eternity past how he saves our souls from eternal suffering of hell. And in chapter 26, you see the beginning of how that's being worked out. Also consider the submissiveness of our Lord. As he tells Peter, he could have called down Uh, legions of angels to protect him. He could have just, as he does in John, just speak from his mouth and slay those who are attempting to take him uh, hostage or take him captive. But he doesn't. He humbly submits. And he does that for our sake, brothers and sisters. So as you read this, uh, remember that, that God the Father and God the Son have combined together for our salvation that through him, God might be glorified. God bless you, brothers and sisters. Enjoy your reading today. Sorry I went a few minutes over. God bless you.